We're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about the three subjects. We're going to talk about what makes the UK a creative hub. I'm going to spend a little bit of time exploring with my fellow panellists whether it's a myth that creative businesses struggle to commercialise their ideas. And then we're going to talk about whether we think education in the UK today and around the world is sufficient to fuel the demand for growth that we're actually seeing created by the industries, which, as Katie said, are generating some £8 billion a year, an hour, for the UK. So let's start by talking about the UK and what makes the UK a successful hub. John, what do you think has led to this amazing success that we're seeing in the UK at the moment? Uh, well, I think it goes back a long time. Uh, it goes back 150 years to the Great Exhibition. It goes back to the formation of our great art schools, which all were part of Prince Albert's passion. And so we were really the first country to create a network of what you might call centres of creative excellence and learning. And when that's embedded in the DNA of the nation, it's, it's pretty difficult to shift, although you might, we might, we'll talk about education today in a moment. Um, there's a couple of other factors though as well. One thing which is incredibly important is the international nature of our design and creative community in London. Uh, and we have it across the UK, but of course London is the capital and people come from all over the world to set up creative businesses in London because as Tom Wolfe says they think this is where it's at and this is very difficult to replicate in other cities around the world. Third reason is the multidisciplinary nature of our creative industries uh, and we're good at every single subject you know design, advertising, publishing, visual arts, games, everything. We're good at all of them uh, and I was saying earlier uh, that if we had an Olympics for our creative industries across the world, we would come top of the table because as well as winning lots of gold medals, we would win lots of silvers and lots of bronzes. There's nowhere else can do it across that width and breadth. Now, there's lots of other reasons, but I will just give you one example of, uh, of how we are observed by everybody in the world. I go around the world promoting Britain's creative industries abroad and I set up the London Design Festival in 2003. Since then, 110 cities have copied it. They've set up their own design festival or their own design week. Why? Are they doing it for fun? Are they doing it for social good? I don't think so. I think they're doing it because they want a piece of the economic success that the creative industries brings in this country and other places that have got it right. So at the moment, we are doing incredibly well uh, and when I go around the world, actually, my job's really easy because I start saying, you know, we're quite good at this. And, and people say, yeah, we know that. How did you do it? Because we want to do what you've done. So it doesn't get much publicity in the UK. Uh, and one of the reasons is it's very disparate. So there's lots of different voices. Um, but it is a very, very important sector. And it also, of course, opens the door for all kinds of other sectors in our conversations around the world to do business because everyone's like everyone likes creativity and culture. So Doug, what do you think? History? Situation? We heard Chukramona talk about immigration and the impact that that's had and, and, and how Britain has always been a traditionally welcoming place and that that's led to a sense of entrepreneurship. What do you think has made the UK the hub it is? Um, well, I want to amplify some of Mr. John's points. Uh, he makes the comment people come from all over the world to London in particular, the UK more broadly to be part of our creative community. It is completely parallel, though unfortunately unobserved, that that's exactly what people say about Silicon Valley in Northern California. The difference is Silicon Valley is a brand. It's a brand that represents sort of the best combination of clusters globally in the tech and web industries. We are the Silicon Valley of the creative industries globally in London. But that level of recognition isn't equal. We have a um, the unfailing modesty of the British to make sure that we remain underrepresented. If the Americans did it half as, if we did half as well, we'd be twice as loud. Um, because we're, you know, somebody once said the big difference between the UK and the US is one country is competent and the other country is confident. Um, <laughs> I'll leave you to decide which is which. Um, and I do think that we need to make sure that people understand that we have a great deal to be proud of here and that, that mm -hmm. the level of pride has to match the level of accomplishment. Because professionally the world knows it, so when Sir John says people come here, it's because in professional circles it's already known. 
I think also macroeconomically, um, there's two primary English-speaking nations in the world, and one of them is global and central, and that's Britain. And just as there's a Francosphere and there's an Anglosphere, English has become a global Anglosphere. In other words, English has now, especially with the internet in the last 15 years, permeated in a way it has never before. And therefore, if you combine, and, and, and language is a conduit for creativity. And therefore, when we have a global creative industry here, we reach everywhere in a way no other country can, because there is no other global English-speaking nation. Finally, because of the fortunate fact of imperialism, Britain got to define where the time zones are. <laughs> and therefore, apparently, time zero is in Greenwich. If you're in the creative industries in LA, which I was for 17 years, you are in what I like to call a time sinkhole. You are actually awake and at work when no other country is awake and at work. And actually, these physical elements play a real role in how one has to perceive the world. Therefore, London is literally the center of the world. It is metaphorically the center of the creative entrepreneurial world. And it is at the center of the English-speaking international society. You combine those things with what John's already brought up, the fact that we have the history of the arts, we have the history of the commercialization of the arts. We have unbelievable depth of bench across almost all subsectors. And you find yourself in a position that London, in particular, and the UK more broadly, is in an impossible to reproduce position. We just now have to actually acknowledge it. And aside from the natural, perhaps, shyness of, of the British in that sense of being, being willing to say we are the centre, do you see any signs more recently that that, that, that confidence is leading to more outward focus of, of staking, of putting that stake in the ground? Or do you think we're still hesitating? No, I think we, you know, we, we have to actually have a champion. We have to actually identify somebody and say, could you please let the world know we're alive? <laughs> so no, the mere fact that he needs to go around the world, <laughs> to my mind, suggests that no, we're not actually improving on that at all. Mm. I actually think that there's any number of dangers to our preeminence, though they're, you know, they're longer term and we have to come back to education. Mm. And I also think that what that we underestimate the degree to which the world would be willing to follow. Um, because, for example, I'm doing a great deal of work in Colombia right now. And Colombia historically, intellectually and artistically, has ties to the United States because the Latin American sphere for English tends to be American driven. But it's changing as we speak. And that's largely because America closed its borders after 9 11. Britain has not yet closed its borders, though we are trying. Um, and with any effort, we can do it too. Um, <laughs> But for the moment, we remain an unbelievably porous society to our benefit. And I think that, I mean, if you look in Colombia today, they are turning towards Britain. The universities are turning towards Britain. The commercial entities are turning towards Britain. And this is ours to win or lose. Because that's true of, you know, there's only 15 or so nations that have near double digit economic growth, of which Colombia would be a small example. Those nations matter for us in the 21st century. And the degree to which we reorient ourselves towards those that grow and remain at the center of it, and we'll continue to punch beyond our weight. So let's talk about education then, because I think that's the natural next place for us to go. Do you think that the education you see here today and around the world, given that people will want to come here, is, is the right kind of education, the right length of education? What do you think is right about what's happening today, and what do you think needs to change quickly? We haven't got very long, have we? Um, <laughs> I see this. Uh, I see this like a kebab stick. We, we're actually um, because uh, education for me is like a kebab stick, which is a, 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 a thing which is about incredible learning and passion and commitment, which has on it primary schools, secondary schools, colleges and universities, or tertiary education, and professional practitioners. And what we need to do is make sure all those bits are joined up. Now, unfortunately, we've actually got two departments of education in this country, one of which is called the Department for Business, interestingly. And if anybody here has ever tried to deal with those departments on a, if you like, cross-departmental issue. So my charity works with school children, 14-year-olds, and we take them into universities on Saturdays and get them extra hours of tuition given by tutors. Now, this is like, imagine a, 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 a photograph of a two pieces of land joined together by a very rickety rope bridge. Those are the two departments. And you've got to cross this rickety rope bridge. You're really lucky if you get to the middle without falling down. So there, there is a fundamental problem in my, in, in, 
I believe, in, in the fact that we're not joined up with the way we think about education. Almost all the debates about education are at higher level. It's about higher um, education. And I, you know, I chair a university, so I know about this. And you know, getting people to talk about links back into schools is extremely difficult. So I believe that we have an enormous amount of work to do to make our education system much better. I'm really talking about creative education which is fundamentally important to the future. But what we're also seeing in our education system, certainly I know this is happening in creative education, is that um, kids from poorer backgrounds are not going to university because they can't afford it. Kids from poorer backgrounds are certainly not doing MAs. There are very few British kids doing MAs in this country now because they can't afford the fees. And they don't want to wait another couple of years to get in the job queue, which is, that's, what, that's them saying that, not me. I think we've got an awful lot of work to do on education. I think we need a big creative step change in the way we think about it. So I don't have any problem with uh, Michael Gove's aspiration that everyone should leave school numerate and literate. Of course they should. But for me that's a kind of ticket to the game and of course that should happen but there are all kinds of other things that we could be doing to improve the way that young people are taught, educated and move smoothly through the system. A great educator called Graham Hills once said to me, the problem with our education system is that it's like a kind of running track, but everyone in the system gets up during the night and put hurdles, puts hurdles up on it so the kids have to jump and they make them bigger and bigger so they have to jump higher and higher. And what we should be doing is taking out all the obstacles so they can go through and have the most brilliant experience. Doug? I've never thought of it as a kebab stick before. Um, <laughs> My kebabs aren't so joined up, they're like pieces like um, What do I think? I think that John's made some points that once again I've just amplified. Um, I do take issue with Michael Gove because I think he confuses focus and blindness. Um, focus says we should be numerate and literate. Blindness says we should do so to the exclusion of other parts of our education. There is a notion that a STEM education is more central than a creative education. I would ask, where did that come from? At what point did we decide that those students who are naturally predisposed to the maths and sciences should somehow be viewed as more important and more central than those who are predisposed to creativity? I would really, I really find this challenging. I think it comes down to, what is a middle class aspiration? As we sit here today, most middle class parents, I pick middle class not because the British newspapers inextricably intertwined. They bind together pushy and middle class, as though you're not allowed to say the words middle class without the adjective pushy, which I think of as parents trying to do the best for their children. What a shame. This is a highly politicized view. <laughs> but rather, I choose middle class because they have largely the freedom to help their children make economic choices without being fettered by the lack of money, and therefore you can ask from a more pure point of view, what would parents do given a choice? And that gives you a closer view as to what natural aspirations are. They choose for their children to have what they call a career, which they mean a profession. And if they mean a profession, it is either in law, accounting, and finance, or in engineer, science, and math, period. You'll notice that entire range of aspiration excludes anything that involves creativity. When in fact, across any normal population, you have a distribution of types of intelligence, and some people are creative and should be in creative endeavors. Therefore, it is puzzling to me why this should be, especially given the fact that actually, our most productive and highest value intellectual property industries are the creative industries. Therefore, when we talk about equipping our students for real jobs, you'd think we would equip them from the real jobs that we currently have that are going begging, rather than the losery jobs that we don't have because we're deeply imitating Silicon Valley. That would be largely my view. Great. Thank you. Can I, um, can I, can I Absolutely, yeah, of course. Um, I gave a talk once at the Royal Society, uh, and. Um, and in, in the talk, I showed a film of some street interviews I did when I went up to people with a microphone and asked them a question. Can I ask the audience this question right now? I went up to people, imagine I came up to you in the street, microphone. Can I ask you a question? You say, okay. And I say, are you creative? So can I ask the audience that question? If you are creative, will you put your hand up, please? <laughs> Quite interesting. Are you counting? You must be very numerous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
OK, that's really interesting. I reckon that's about 90% of the audience. Vast majority. Vast majority. Um, you see, everyone's creative. Not everyone thinks they are, but actually everyone's creative. And I think most people value their creativity, no matter what you do. And I, I don't, you know, I work with kids mainly in the area of art and design. I don't care whether they become artists or designers, because the work we do with them helps them unlock and understand and develop their creativity. I don't care what they go and do as long as they're happy in their lives and they find the right thing for them. But everybody is creative, and we all use our creativity in different ways. And the reason why people succeed is because they manage to apply their creativity to whatever it is they're doing. So actually, you know, I, I believe we're all in the creative industries, really. And by the way, we are absolutely lousy at promotion of the creative industries, really terrible. Um, and that's our fault. It's not the government's fault, it's our fault. It's the creative industry's fault because we're very bad at telling the story. But it's not surprising when you've got, you know, you've got advertising people and you've got publishing people and design people and architects and, you know, there's about 12, 15 different, if you like, little tribes which make up this one thing. And they're always trying to tell different stories about their own bits. So telling the big story is really never that easy. Um, but I, you know, we're all creative. And actually, it's up to us, I think, to do something about this. I, I don't think we can sort of say, what are they doing about it? I think we should do something about it. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes just, uh, just exploring a myth with you both. We hear a lot of times people talk about creative businesses struggle to commercialise their ideas. We've seen a lot today who haven't struggled, but we've often talked uh, independently about all of our own business failures and the way that we've had failures and setbacks and what we've learned from them. So I just want to say to you for a moment, do you think it's a myth or a truth that people struggle with that commercialisation? And if they do struggle, is the struggle a positive? Doug, um, what do you think? Well, I think there's, the myth here is that creative businesses are any different than any other startup. The fact is my experience has been mostly in my life with technology startups. And most technology startups start with somebody going, look what I've invented. Oh goodness, it applies to every possible market in the world. My God, I'm going to become rich. And people start from this notion of the invention, not the problem. Well, that's actually the biggest struggle to commercialize in the world, is if you start from a philosophy of invention instead of problem solving, then fact is, you have a huge effort to get what amounts to a tech geek to recognize that markets matter at all. Most tech geeks feel deeply that customers are an inconvenience on the way to the <laughs> celebration of their invention. <laughs> Whereas largely, the design industries are actually taught the opposite. You design for purpose, you design, you express things. In a box, it's like haiku. You know, we give people a very strict structure and then say, be really creative inside here and break all the rules and solve these problems. And that actually is by definition a much more worldly activity. So my experience has been actually just the opposite. Hmm. That the design-led businesses start with a reason to be, whereas many of the tech-led biz businesses, certainly ones I've invested in, did not have any reason to be at all. <laughs> <laughs> and John, agree or disagree? Oh yeah, I agree. But I, I, I just say this, I, you know, I, I'm on a mission. Uh, at UAL to try and make sure all the kids who leave at the end actually really know about business. And this is partly based on my own experience because I, I went to art school when I was 16. I left when I was 19. I started my first business. And after about six or seven months, having worked for quite a few clients, we were wondering why no one had paid us. And it was because we didn't know that you were supposed to send a thing called an invoice <laughs> when you did a job. I think there is an enormous amount of ignorance around of, of, of very basic business activity and I talk to kids who are about to graduate and I, I'm so worried for them because they don't know what to do when they get out there in terms of business. They know they, their craft is good but I think we could do an enormous amount. Um, so our little Saturday club my foundation runs which is an art and design Saturday club. It's in 33 universities and colleges around the country, 1,000 kids every Saturday, 100 hours of extra tuition over the year. They're taught by tutors in universities and colleges. It's not school, they don't have to turn up. It's actually self-selecting because they go the first week because their teacher suggested it. They don't have to show again. They all turn up for 30 Saturdays. But I want to do it for all kinds of other subjects. I want to do it for economics. You know, 14 year olds doing economics and I've talked to professors of economics who say, we'll teach them about gambling. We'll teach them about the stock exchange. We'll teach them, we'll really teach them about how money works in their lives and how that relates to the way you live and the way you structure your life. 
you know, I want to teach all kinds of things on Saturdays and try and do those things that you don't get at school and actually you don't get at university by looking at things from another angle. And that's the future for me. It's about the next generation, the next creative generation, because I think that the future for the UK is to be the most creative nation in the world and to then present ourselves to the world as the best possible creative partner. Now, everybody wants to work with creative partners. Do you want to work with someone who's not creative? We all love working with creative people. So if we are seen by the countries around the world that we want to do business with as the, most, as the best possible creative partner, I think that's a great future for the country. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've left you all with a point of view that um, you are more creative than you might have thought before we started. And I will just thank John and Doug for a provocative conversation. Thank you. Thank you.